passivity. There's way too much passivity. There's way too much, uh, well, God is God and he's sovereign, do whatever he wants. But the issue is there's a difference between the God of the philosophers and the God of the scriptures. The God of the philosophers, de dealing a lot with Greek philosophies that were brought into Christian theology, deals with if God is God, then all these things are going to be his character, one of which is in passivity, which means he's not subject to feeling. Yet it says God weeps. It says that God laughs. It says there's great joy. It says sorrow. It's, uh, it says that he, that he would, would, would never change. And yet he's a, he's a God who doesn't change, yet he changes in the sense he can change his mind. The word, re, uh, he, he changes his mind about things in response to us. God is a God that is looking for people who will partner with him because in his sovereignty, he's chosen to do things through us. And to do things through us, he needs people who will yield to him, trust in him, obey him, listen to him, not, be, uh, not allow fear to control them, and follow him wherever he is leading. God is looking for that person, man or woman, who is just a person of, that's yielded, trusting, and, 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 and is crying out, God, I want more. Now, the irony of that is most of the people that I've seen receive the greatest impartations a lot of them, if not most, at least a lot, were people who had already been serving God for years. Some of them 15, 20, 25, 30 years. They're in a place of dryness. And sometimes they're in a place of a weak, weakness in the sense of not that they're weak in their faith, but they're weak in their body. Sometimes they literally have pushed themselves to where that they, they literally need God to touch them because either emotionally or physically they have come to the end of themselves and they are aware that I don't have the stamina, the strength, the health, the, 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 the soundness of mind to do this anymore apart from God come and not just anointing me but healing me. Heidi was that way. Well, when the first time she went to Toronto, she got physically healed. The second time is when um, she received the impartation. Um, I know a lot of my friends that were ready after 30 years of being in, in the ministry and, and 15 to 20 years in the vineyard were ready to quit. If God didn't touch them, they, just, they, they said, I've become dry. I still believe the same things, but I am dry and I need God to touch me. And they came to Brazil with me saying, God, Randy, if God doesn't touch us, we can't go on. We didn't sign up for this. There's got to be more to it than this. We're actually, we're so discouraged. We're looking in the, the one ads for a different job. Not because we're uh, backsliding. It's just that we don't have anything left to give. And we're not going to go through the motions. We, it's like we are, we have been wrung out. There's nothing left in us to give to anybody. And because of that, we really, we shouldn't even stay in the ministry. And I saw people like that, that came one last time, said, Lord, if this is real, or, or Lord, I do believe it's real, but I need to get in on it because I don't have anything left to give. I can't give out of my flesh. I need to be out of your spirit. That's what God, Jesus was talking about. The, the, the forceful one. And it's not that you're just so strong, you're forcing your way in, but it's out of your brokenness. And Paul said, in my weakness, I know his strength. And it's in that place of just crying out, God, you know, you're, you're knocking on heaven's door. You're saying, Lord, this is not a, this is not a, a an option. It's either you got to touch me or there are, I don't have anything left to give. And not that we have to get to that place where we can be touched again, but I'm telling you, some of the greatest turnarounds is, has been in situations like that. God is, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence and the violent ones, the forceful ones, uh, take it by force. In Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, it says, the eyes of God roam to and fro across the earth in, in the Revised Standard Version, looking for someone through whom he can show himself strong. Think of that. You say, I'm looking for more of God. God's looking for more people through whom he can show himself strong. Chad, I'm prophesying to you. I know I'm your employer. I know you're your friend. But right now, I'm prophesying to you in the spirit. Take this seriously. You are one of the forceful ones. And God is going to use you mightily. You are going to see miracles. God is going to use you. You are a forceful one. And you're just on the precipice. Of the things that God's going to do. Because he sees your heart. sees the purity in you. And uh, I've never 
he probably, I've never said this to him, but I'm, I'm in the spirit. God says, you are one of those forceful ones. You're going to take the kingdom by force. The eyes of God roam to and fro across the earth, looking for someone through whom he can show himself strong. I believe the Lord is always looking. Where's a man? Where's a woman that I can show myself strong? Where's a man? Where's a woman I can show myself strong and they'll not touch my glory? Where's a man? Where's a woman that I can show myself strong? And the fact that I can show myself strong, there's enough humility in them, it won't destroy them. God sometimes does not put certain things on people at a certain stage when you want it is because you're not prepared for it. Because if it came upon you, you're not in a place yet to sustain the weight of that glory and the glory itself because there's not the foundations laid um, would, could actually destroy you. And that's usually for those that's new in the Lord. It's hard to carry that level of anointing. And, and uh, walk it out and be faithful and end well. Man, man I, I'm telling you, I want to end well. It's not just how we start. I want to end well. I want to end well. I've read the books. It's frightening how many of these forceful ones didn't end well. It's difficult. This is, this is high octane um, stuff. This is nitroglycerin. You can get your hands blowed off if you don't know how to handle it. But if you'll lean into his breast, you'll hear him whisper in your ears how to handle it. Even when you don't know. If you ask, he'll tell you. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 is the only place in the Bible that actually lists the alpha course of the first century. It is the only place that I know of where it actually gives. These are the basic, essential, foundational doctrines of apostolic Christianity. Nowhere else in the Bible you'll find this. And there's six of them. And one of them is what I'm talking about to you today. Uh, the, my book on There's More. It d really is a book that's a defense of the doctrine of impartation, laying on hands of Portuguese imposition de Monts. Um, and, and, but it's also uh, uh, the defense of the whole Toronto because of the fruit. It's a listing. This is the fruit that came out of that move that most people don't know about. Here are the thousands of churches and millions of people that have come. And, uh, uh, and there's so much more that could have been written. But in this, because uh, the reason why I'm saying this, I want to do two things today. I'm trying to hurry and I don't want to get myself messed up in my hurrying. But I want to, first of all, uh, speak to you as a Brian, two Brians. And I want you to consider biblically speaking, what we're about to do to see whether or not it's biblical. That's what the brilliance. Let's study this out more thoroughly. And I, after I lay a biblical foundation, because if I start out with stories, people can say, he's not of the word. He's not a man of the word. He's, 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 he just tells about experiences and stories and just types to work up emotions. So, no, I want to start with the word of God. Lay a foundation. To, you might see that what I'm talking about is very biblical. The purpose of the stories afterward is, to con is that you will not fall prey to the trap of what I call cessationism, which worships the God of I, the great I was and the great I will be, but the, the, the kind of like the great I retired right now. Because that really is what cessation basically ends up in. The great I was, what he did in the past. And the great I will be, what he's going to do in the millennium. And when we read what the scripture says, most of us say, well, that's not for now, that's for the millennium. Well, that was only for back then. And so the stories that follow is to let you see that what the Bible said happened in the Bible is still happening today. So the stories is to make you aware that this is not just some historical account of what God used to do, but it's an account that's biblical and it's still happening today that your faith 
might be increased, that your hunger might be increased. I am preaching that you might become thirsty because Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I'm hoping this message will create thirst and faith in you that you will want it, desire it, and feel like this is not of the devil. Randy's really not moving in the call. He's laid a biblical foundation. He's told us these stories that we know are true, and, it, and, and it's got the fruit of Jesus all over it. And so I'm a look in my life, and I'm, I'm seeing a dryness that's there, and I'm saying, I need to come and drink of the water of life. And so I'm coming out of my, not because I deserve it, but I'm coming with a great faith in grace and I'm going to receive even though I feel unworthy man when I met Wimber the first time the first word out of my mouth John Wimber is I'm not even worthy for you to pray for me that was really the first sentence I ever said to John Wimber I'm not worthy for you to pray for me I know I do not have anything that has ever happened in my life has not come because I deserved it it's, it's come out of his grace and, and, and so to, to this afternoon some of the stories I'm going to tell you, hopefully if I have time, are people that didn't deserve it. And, and, and I want to say two things. One is most of the people who get touched powerfully have been very desirous. Sometimes they'll fast for days before they get to the meeting. Uh, sometimes uh, they're, they're so desperate they've been crying out in secret. And God will, re God will reward and manifest in public to, a, to the private prayers that's been prayed leading up to this. And that's usually the people are hungry or they're open. They desire it. Now, that's the usual. The exception is in these meetings, sometimes there are people sitting there judging the meeting, don't like the meeting, don't agree with what I'm saying, don't believe it's real, and actually upset at the, 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 the teaching. And God has come on them and did to them everything they were mocking. Those are, though, the exception. Because God is looking. And, and this got me in trouble. Matter of fact, in my church, um, I haven't got to the... I've got to hold that. Chad, don't let me forget to come back to the, my church experience back in Fillertown. So I'm going to go back and lay this biblical foundation just like I said I was going to. Um, so we see in Hebrews chapter 6, there's um, Paul's talk... Or Barnabas, I believe it's actually Barnabas that wrote the book of Hebrews. There's reason for that, but we don't have time to go into it. Uh, we don't really know who wrote it for sure. But anyway... Um, these are the six doctrines. And he said, not laying again the elementary teachings, but going on to maturity, not laying again the elementary teachings, these foundational teachings. And here they are. Repentance from acts that lead to death, number one. Two, faith in God. Number three, the doctrine of baptisms is in the plural. It's not singular. Water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism. Number four, the doctrine of the, the laying on of hands. And number five, um, resurrection of the dead. And number six, eternal judgment. So number four, the laying on of hands, is one of the six elementary teachings of apostolic Christianity. But I went through four years of college, majored, minored, took all my electives in religious studies, three more years of graduate school at seminary, and never heard one teaching on laying on of hands. And yet it's one of the six foundational teachings. Elementary. These are the basic things. It's not the much more pure. I'm not trying to figure out what the seventh horn on this thing means. I'm just trying to figure out these basic things. What is the doctrine of laying on of hands? Or what is the laying on of hands? Well, the laying on of hands was for blessing. They, the parents all the time were asking Jesus to lay, their hands on his, on, lay his hands on their children to bless them. Laying on of hands was for identification. Leviticus 16, where the high priest laid his hands on the first goat, cut his throat, took his blood, justification. Lay his hand on the second goat after he'd come out of the Holy of Holies, laid it outside the camp, bearing away the sins of the people. Sanctification. But in laying on of his hands, he was taking the sins of the people who had been happened that year and there was identification with that goat with the sins of the people laying on of hands was a part of identification laying on of hands was for healing you shall lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover all of these things is in, in in this understanding of what happens with the laying on of hands laying on of hands was also not only for blessing not only for impartation impart, not only for blessing and uh, identification and healing but laying on of hands was uh, connected to impartation of gifts or activation of gifts or stirring up or even the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I am not saying that you have to have hands laid on you to be baptized in the Spirit. Um, matter of fact, the early Pentecostal church, uh, 
and the 19th, 20th century rejected the latter rain movement because there was such an emphasis of laying on of hands for the baptism of the spirit and prophecy. And the, the, the model had been in the first uh, uh, movement was the tearing meetings like in Acts chapter 2. And I just want to say, I am not saying that I or somebody has to lay hands on you if you have gifts stirred up in you. That would be untrue. But it would also be untrue. The only way you can get something is you've got to seek God in prayer or a group of you in prayer, tearing meetings, praying for weeks, praying until God finally comes. If I said that's the only way, that'd be, that would not be true either. Because in the Bible, there are two streams, two ways that God moves. Why do we have to think God only moves in one way? There's diversity in the scriptures, much diversity. And so you see in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, where they're gathered together. They just, the disciples just got out of prison. They've been beaten. They've been told not to preach anymore in Jesus' name. And, and, and because they had healed somebody, they'd been thrown in prison and they'd been beaten. And they come back and they talk to the church and both Peter cries, begins to cry out and begins to pray. And basically, if I summarize his prayer, I said, Lord, that stuff that got us in trouble, that stuff that got us beaten, that stuff that got us put in prison, Lord, the signs and wonders, healing, give us more of it. Extend your mighty hand, oh God, and give us more of it. And God answered that prayer. And the place where there's that shook. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And spoke with boldness spoke of the word of god with boldness they were acts 4 31 now in acts 2 they spoken as the, uh, they spoke in tongues as the spirit of god gave them utterance. here they spoke with boldness as the spirit of god uh, was upon them now so in those two there's no laying on of hands in acts chapter 10 where cornelius peter's preaching at cornelius to cornelius and his household and he's, he's bringing them according to what peter said to the to the uh, elders of the church in chapter 11 of acts Peter said, I, the, I, the angel had said, had told um, Cornelius to go down to Joppa to one Simon Peter and ask for him. He will bring you a message by which a future tense verb will be saved, you and your household. Future tense verb. In the sense of full understanding of Christian regeneration, he's going to bring you a message by which you will be saved. As he's bringing the message by which they will be saved, God sovereignly saves them, comes on them, and they begin to speak in tongues as they had in Acts chapter 2. But there's no laying on of hands. So they received salvation and a baptism of the Spirit simultaneously, or if you're strong on subsequent, a few seconds later, and, uh, uh, and, and there's no laying on of hands. So I believe I received my gift of tongues with nobody with me. I was just praying in the baptistry, uh, changing room of the Baptist church, and it happened to me sovereignly uh, by myself. Nobody was slapping me on the back. Nobody was trying to get me to repeat the names of Japanese cars or anything. I was just, you know, I, 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 it just happened. You know, there's, there's nobody there, just me and God. And, 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 and I'm not after a gift. I'm, my focus here is not tongues. I, I, I'm like Paul. I wish everybody spoke in tongues. It's Christian. I think we should, ought to. It's a benefit. It's helpful in times, you know, there's, I can't go into that teaching, but there's just benefit to it. It doesn't make me superior. It's a sign of my weakness. So it's, boy, I, there's times I need to pray and I don't know what to say. It helps me then. There's times I want to praise and I run out of words and I don't have any more words to say in praise. It helps me then. There's times I don't know, I understand what my own spirit's feeling. I'm, just, I'm messed up inside. I don't even know what's messing me up. My brain can't understand what my spirit's feeling. It helps me then. And so for me, it's not a sign I'm better than you are. For me, it's just a crutch that helps me. It's just, it's, it's just a benefit. And, and, uh, but anyway, I've got to get off of that. But uh, the other way you receive things in the Bible is the laying on of hands. It is biblical. So don't, I mean, I want you to be, feel that what we're about to do is biblical. And um, it doesn't mean, though, that I've got to lay my hands on you. It's part of the team. I mean, just under the word... God is going to get, cause hunger. God is going to touch some of you. They're desperate. And some of you may be in the back and people may come up real quick and we can't get to you. And the anointing of God is on you. Don't think that I, Randy's got to get to me. Pray for me before this is going to happen. No, I'm not saying that. But there's some that, you know, there's times you pray for him. I prayed for one guy in another church. He was way in the back and he couldn't even get there. And I said, you don't even have to be here. God is here. He's going to touch you. You can take it by faith. And, it, and he's walking out the door before he can get back to his hotel room. He's he knocked, <laughs> basically knocked down in the hallway of the hotel. And he's just laying. <laughs> but nobody, you know, laid hands on him except God did. <laughs> and, and, and that's valid too. So it, it's, it's not like mechanical. It's relational. And, 
And but for some people, right, they, they need to press through. Now, when we see this in the Bible, Numbers eleven seventeen says, God spoke to Moses. And by the way, there's no laying on hands here. God spoke, this is the first doctrine of, of, of transference of the anointing. God spoke to Moses in Numbers eleven seventeen. He said, gather the elders together and I will come down. I will take the spirit that's on you and put it on them. And they'll help you carry the burden of the people. God, see, God said, gather them together. I know that this is the pattern. This is what God wants to do. Pastors, apostles, gather your leaders together. And, and, and I, get to be, I just get to be the donkey he rides into town on. And, and, and it's so exciting to see what he does. Because I know people come, won't you lay hands on me? I said, well, if I lay hands on you right now, probably nothing's going to happen. And anyone who try to lay hands on you later, you won't have as much faith as now. Let me teach the word. Let me tell you the stories, the power of the testimony. Because I believe there's times that God orchestrates and he builds faith. And if you let me lay hands on you, if I lay hands on you, now, probably nothing much is going to happen. And so I know it's not mechanical, but it's, it's the God honoring his word of just teaching. This is one of the ways of God. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 9, it says, Moses, jo- uh, uh, says Joshua, the son of Nun, received the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. In uh, 1 Timothy 4.14. And I always get 1 Timothy 4.14 mixed up with 2 Timothy 1.6 and I, when I'm not looking at it. But anyway, it says, uh, For this reason I say, I need to stir up the gift you receive through the laying on of my hands when the body of, of, of uh, elders laid their hands on him and prophesied. And so that was probably his ordination when he was sent out in the ministry that he received a gift. Do, do not neglect the gift you received through the laying on of hands. In, uh, he, in, in Timothy, he writes to him twice, stir up the gift, fan in the flame, the gift you receive through the laying on of hands and prophecy. Do not neglect the gift you receive through the laying on of my hands. So he received a gift of the Holy Spirit that came through the laying on of hands and perhaps two gifts. We don't know if it's the same gift or not he's speaking about in Second Timothy. When he himself laid his hands on him. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 6, when Paul had just ba- laid his hands on those who had just been baptized in Jesus' name because they were, uh, it says, the disciples at Ephesus. Uh, they could have been the disciples of John. I don't really know if they were disciples of Christ yet because they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. That seems odd in our New Testament sermon. You not even hear the Holy Spirit. But it is a doctrine of subsequence in their case because Paul then educated them more, taught them more thoroughly about Jesus. He baptized them. And then after he baptized them, I believe Paul baptized them if he baptized them they were had believed they were christians and so this happened in subsequent subsequent to their conversion and then when he lays his hands on them they began the holy spirit came upon them and they began to speak in tongues and they began to prophesy this are two gifts that manifested immediately with the laying on of hands of the apostle paul in acts chapter 8 Around, down around verse 18 or so, uh, Peter and John have come down and they've joined Philip at the preaching and the revival, the great revival of Samaria, which is kind of like half Jews. And there was a lot of prejudice in the church yet. And the church, you know, it, apart from the Holy Spirit, the church doesn't go very well. Now, let me say it differently. Apart from the Holy Spirit, the church is not missionary. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, the church gets self-centered. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, the church plays it safe. It is the Holy Spirit. He is the great missionary. Even as Jesus came as the great missionary, the Holy Spirit continues that missionary activity of of, of Jesus in the heart of the people. And when there's people are not going to the nations, when people are not going to the streets, when people are not going to the poor, when people are not taking the power of the kingdom to heal the sick, it's because the church has so little presence of Holy Spirit. But when Holy Spirit comes in and, and administers the rule of Christ in that church, people cannot sit any longer people have got to go the gospel starts with two words go and so and by the way they said one of the reasons the holy spirit came in his way was every time god was breaking through a new people group from the jews to the half jews the samaritans and then to the god fears at cornelius house and finally just to open just plain old gentiles that weren't even god fears and hadn't joined themselves with the synagogue yet every time that happened God would cause signs of his presence, whether it was power. Now, in Acts chapter 8, we don't know if they spoke in tongues or not. doesn't say. I personally believe if they did, it would have said so. 
but it could have. I'm not going to argue with you about it. But something was happening that was so visible that Simon, the magician, the sorcerer, who had been an occultic man of great power himself, and he saw the real power, he forsook that old power and submitted to the gospel. But now he sees something happening. So he offers money to Peter so that whoever I lay my hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, you can, you, you can perish thinking you're going to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, oh, please intercede for me that that won't happen to me. Because there was, he, why would he ask such a thing? Because they were laying their hands on them and something was happening. People say, I don't like manifestations. Well, thank God for manifestations because the manifestations was the way they could tell that they had received the Holy Spirit. Somebody said, well, I just receive it. I'm, going to, I'm just going to take it by faith. We do take it by faith, but we don't have to stand. We don't have to. We, we receive by faith, but the evidence of our faith is our experience. F, um, not F.F. F. Bruce, but um, Pentecostal Assemblies of God guy um, wrote uh, the uh, Empowering Presence of God, F. Uh, Gordon Fee. Uh, Dr. Gordon Fee has written a book about this thick, and it's on every reference to the Apostle Paul to the Holy Spirit. I don't know if any of you have read it or not, but it's really, really good, and there's a short, more, uh, shorter version of it. Bottom line of that book is that the second most important doctrine to the Apostle Paul is you are justified by grace through faith. The more foundational, the, the first most important foundation is you can know you've been justified by the experience of the Spirit. Now, did you hear that? The second most important was you're justified by grace through faith. The most important one is you can know you've been justified by grace through faith by the evidence of the Spirit. Otherwise, the question that Paul asked the Galatians, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by faith? That question implies that you can know experientially that you have received the Spirit. Otherwise, that question doesn't make a bit of sense. So, it is important that we have this hunger, this desire to flow with his power and those gifts to be operative. Another Protestant error that's common amongst many Protestants is discover your gift. Everybody gets one gift. Discover your gift and use it. That's silly. And it's not what it means. The, it, the, unex, the unspeakable and unexpressible gift received is the gift of new life in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. He is the gift himself that is given to us and when you have the Holy Spirit in you do you know what the Holy Spirit has all of the gifts in him that means that you could potentially move in any gift the Holy Spirit needs to come out of you at that time and if you believe you only get one gift need to discover that gift and work on that gift then you're going to limit yourself to one gift when God has given you a greater gift the Holy Spirit himself he has all the gifts and so you can move in all the gifts as the Spirit would release them in you but you can even cry out and ask for a particular manifestation of gifts and, and you say oh no I'm, I'm just seeking the giver I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not wanting, I'm just wanting his face I don't want his hand and he's sitting there give, reaching out his hand towards you as an expression it's like, oh no I don't want your hand I just want your face I'm telling you it's, it's not it's bold God I, I want to know you I want to feel you I want to feel your love I want, I, I'm seeking you for you but God I know you're a God that loves to give and to, to, to not to value what you want to give to you is to not honor you. And so I'm going to honor you by receiving with gratitude and faith and love the very gifts you want to give to me at this time. God is a God who is gracious. You cannot outgive Him. We usually use that in a sense of money. Uh, money is a little thing compared to this. This is so much more important than money. There's the glory of God, the power of God, the strength of God, the gifts of God can flow through you and you don't have to deserve it or earn it. It comes to you. So we see in the Bible... Oh, God, help me. We see in the Bible, these are two different ways that you can receive. Laying on of hands. Somebody said, well, when you get into more doctrinal books, you don't see so much emphasis on it. But in the book of Romans, the most doctrinal of all of Paul's books that he wrote in number chapter 1, verse 11, he writes in his kind of introduction to the Roman church, he said, I wanted to come to you that I might explain the gospel to you. Nope, doesn't say that. He said, I wanted to come to you that I might uh, uh, strengthen you in your theology. No, nope, doesn't say that either. Matter of fact, it says, I wanted to come to you 
that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. And then he realizes that's kind of a heavy thing. Say, or rather, we might be mutually encouraged by one another's faith. So we see. And, and, and Paul himself, he, he said, our gospel doesn't consist of talk but of power. I, one time I got upset. I was listening to Christian radio and I was just getting upset. And I said, God, why am I getting upset? This is, I'm not listening to secular radio. Or not that you shouldn't. But I was listening to Christian radio. And I said, well, the more I listen to it, the more I just, I feel just tearing. And my, I, I'm, I'm getting upset. Lord, why am I getting upset? I don't understand. I'm listening to Christian radio. And, and it just came to my head. Talk, talk, talk. There's too much talk and not enough power. That's why you're upset. They just talk about my power, but they don't manifest my power. There's a great need for less talk and more of the presence and demonstration of the Father's love. Let me say this. I believe that there's people all over the world that doesn't believe in our message, that doesn't believe in the good news of this gospel because all they've ever heard is our talk and they need to see our walk and they need to see... Not, not, I'm not just talking now. This, there, that's where it gets dangerous because we found of holiness sometimes just what we don't do. Oh, a holy person doesn't do this. A holy person doesn't do that. But I tell you, a holy person is so in love with Jesus Christ, they do what he did. A holy person desires to give mercy away. A holy person desires to welcome the sinner. A holy person desires to heal the sick. A holy person desires to cast out demons. A holy person, a holy person might sit down and drink a, bottle, a glass of wine at a meal and get up and cast a demon out of somebody. And that person is more holy to me than somebody that's a teetotaler but never demonstrates and manifests the power of God. Now, I... I, I want to ask you, ex, excerpt, take that out because I don't want that to be a sound bite used against me. But I, the point was, I wanted to make that we miss the holiness, understand of holiness. It's the character. It is, there's nobody that's ever been more holy than Jesus. And they called him a wine bibber, a glutton. Why? He had friends that were sinners. But was there anybody more holy than him? We sometimes need the power of God to make us. No, we all the time. We need this visitation, this power of God to make us more like him. And one of the great needs is the baptism, not just a power, but of love. A baptism that makes us less self-centered. A baptism of love and of power. Well, have I laid enough biblical foundation for you? You can say at least this is biblical. Let's, i got to quickly go on. Here's some stories. Just some. I could tell you a whole lot more. You know, one of the greatest stories is, is for me is, Mark, you're one of my heroes. And I don't know if people know who you are. But this Lutheran farm boy, I just spent some time listening. I, gotta, I can't wait to get with him to hear more of the God stories in his life. Heidi Baker, Leif Hetland. For me, you're in that category with Heidi and Leif because of the selflessness, the fearlessness, the compassion, the love, the joy. And I do pray, Mark, that you get a fresh, fresh revelation and God's Spirit just to be upon you and take you to another level that you've come you know, you've come to hear me, but I would love to hear you. And I'm praying for you. God, I, I bless Mark. I pray, God, would you give Mark a special grace and give, open his eyes to see more in the spirit realm, his ears to hear be better. And I just pray, God, uh, everything you've done to him and in him is so holy and pure. Just multiply it. And may he leave here, God, having come from Malaysia, may he leave here, God, with more. What he asked, what he wanted, give him more. Do exceedingly abundantly above all he could have asked or thought. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, real quickly, just a little bit. You know, this, this guy, he goes into the dangerous areas, into the village where you're not supposed to do, risk his life all the time. And he was a wealthy man making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. He walked away from it and gave his life to the Lord. And now he and his wife are in Malaysia and they're being used powerfully. They're hidden. But I look forward every month to seeing what's he doing now. It always starts out, pray for us. Of course, our lives are being threatened. We're going into places. We're doing things we should and do and he's right here this is an example of a man who was with us in in a meeting somewhere in the united states we prayed for him god's power came upon him 
radically affected he and his wife's life. And they're here, right here in this very meeting. Heidi Baker, we prayed for Heidi. She, I was preaching this message. She came to the front. I saw her. I didn't know I prophesied then. I just thought I was praying. And, and I, I saw her. And I said, Heidi, God wants to know, do you want the nation of Mozambique? And she looks up. She's on her knees. She's crying. And she says, yes. And I heard myself say, God is going to give you the nation of Mozambique. You'll see the blind, see the deaf, hear the lame walk, and the dead are going to be raised. The fire of God came upon her. She told me later, she felt like that instantly she'd been put in an oven of 150 degrees as you'd begin to perspire profusely and she's shaking under the power of God. She get, it's so strong at one point, she said, and, she, and Heidi's used to a lot of things, and, but it's so strong at one point, she said, God, you're scaring me. You're going to kill me. And she hears the audible voice of say, good. I need you dead. Wouldn't that scare you? You try out, God, you're going to kill me and actually hear him say, good, I need you dead. I don't know, that, 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 at that moment, he wasn't the comforter. He was the empowerer. And for seven days and seven nights, this last, she, she heard the audible voice of God say, hundreds of churches and thousands of people. She said, God, how can that be? My husband and I started seven churches, four churches in 17 years. It's almost killed us. And God began to show her in a vision. I tell you, you should ask God, desire from God. Speak to me. Let me hear you. Impressions or an audible voice, visions, dreams. God, as I'm under your power, it's not just I'm under your power. I want to have direction. For me, I, I taught once on, on history changers and the history makers. And I, there's three things that go in it. They have a powerful experience of the fire and power of God. And they have an understanding from God of their destiny. They know where they're called. They know what they're supposed to do. And if they don't know where they're called, they know what they're supposed to do. And then God will show them later where it's going to be at. But this understanding of power, experience. Experience of power, experience of revelation of their purpose creates, creates, number three, a supernatural faith that no matter what comes against them, they are not afraid. They trust God and they do things and no matter what happens in their life. For Heidi, I told her that in the first 18 months after that, they lose 90% of their support from one church that didn't like Toronto that gave them 90% of their support. I say you're going to get the nation of Mozambique. In 18 months following that word, she's hit with MS. Rollins in the hospital, Sarah Malaria, they lose 90% of their support. The government confiscates all the orphanage buildings that they had. Does that sound like the word is coming to pass in those first 18 months? No, it looked like the exact opposite. It looked like the opposite. The million dollars this one church had promised them said you either decide you want to lay on the floor and laugh or you want to feed children. But if you don't distance yourself from Toronto, we're, going to, we're not only going to tear off 90% of your support, that million dollars we promised you is not coming through. She, she said, I can't deny this is God. Lost a million dollars. Lost 90% of her support. The doctor said you got MS. And if you go back to Mozambique, you'll die. She said, I'll not die. Now, why? Because she's standing in such faith. I heard her preach this when I first met her in, uh, after that had happened in, at Bill's church and I wept and wept and cried went through a box of Kleenex myself that week because I understood that what happened to her had changed to her I understood that she could stand in the midst of everything wrong going on that the devil threw against her and she could stand I will not die I will I preach from a wheelchair until God raises me up he's going to give me this nation where does that kind of faith come from it comes from the experience of God that is so real that the devil cannot shake what he's told you he's going to do because you cannot forget what he did to you. That is the value of manifestation. Not all manifestations are God, but a manifestation that causes you to give your life away in behalf of others, that's a manifestation of God. A manifestation that gives you fire in your bones for Jesus is manifestations from God. A manifestation that gives you uh, such a, a love for the purpose of God and takes fear away when people shoot at you and people try to kill you. You do not quit. I'll tell you what, those manifestations didn't come from the devil. The manifestation that caused you to fall more in love with Jesus, you could know it's God. You cannot tell by looking at manifestation whether that's God or the devil. You have to wait and inspect the fruit. That's how you can tell whether it's from God or it was of the enemy is the, when they look the same. And sometimes they look just the same. Because the enemy is a copier. There's this one. Oh, I don't have time to tell you that story. Um, all right. Leif Hetland. I was a little church 
Hoggins in Norway. About 30 to 50 pastors. I'm going down praying for them. I'm not getting any prophecy because I wasn't looking for it. I didn't even know what. I didn't think I could prophesy. I'm just praying. And I bless, 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 bless. And I get the lay. He's, he was in his 30s. He's a um, blonde-headed Norwegian guy. And, and, I, and I said, uh, I see you. You're in this place of darkness. All around you is darkness. And, 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 and behind you is light like this. If he's here, this area, the triangle, is light. But all of this is darkness all around you. And I said, and I see a multitude of people coming out of the darkness and following you in the light. And God says that he's going to make you a bulldozer. You're going to make a way where there's not been a way. God says you're a bulldozer. Power of God hits him, knocks him in the ground. He told me, he said, I don't know if it's two and a half hours or three. But somewhere between two and a half hours and three, I laid on the floor and shook violently. He didn't understand the prophecy. didn't understand how to interpret it. And so he got up. And the next week, he, this, this Baptist guy had never experienced too many of the gifts of the Spirit or hardly any of them. But that week, he knew what people were feeling. He knew what people were thinking. He could prophesy. He, every person he prayed for got healed, which was, um, had never happened in his life. But he didn't understand its purpose. And in that ensuing year, continuing as a Baptist pastor, he has his neck broke by an accident. His car and back broke by an accident. And as he's recuperating in traction, and I don't think God sent those at all. I think the enemy is trying to kill him. And, and as he's sitting there in traction, he's meditating one day about this experience. And all of a sudden, duh, for me, he wrote, oh my gosh, I understand it now. I'm not to continue to be a Baptist pastor. I'm to give, I'm to go to the unreached people groups. And he started to go to Pakistan. And immediately... There was favor and powers on him. And now he has led 850,000 Pakistani Muslims to Jesus Christ in crusades in Lahore. He does what the people say is impossible to do. And God has given him favor. He has favor with some of the highest ranking Muslim clerics in the world. He's had him, you know, full robe, beard and everything. Come and visit him in Alabama. When they got off. Ended up at his door knocking it because they considered him a friend. And one day when he's getting ready, he had a glorious healings and everything. The leading Muslim cleric of the nation, Pakistan, called him. He calls him his friend. If you're my friend, I'm telling you, don't go back to the meeting tonight. Because the, um, blank, blank, the name of the group, the violent ones, um, uh, the, the, the terrorist, um, Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda. They're showing up with 50 millimeter sh machine guns on the back of cars and they're going to they're, they're going to kill you. He's had to escape and, 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 and the Lord has protected him. But that's the fruit of the experience. I prayed for one Baptist pastor in, in a Baptist church in Buenos Aires. He was just starting a new little church. And, and he had, I prayed to him two or three times. He'd already fallen to, twice. He'd fallen down. It's midnight. He comes to me. He says, pray for me again. I said, I've already prayed for you twice. Or maybe it's three times. He says, I know, but you got prayed for more than that. So pray for me. So I prayed for him. And the power got hit him this time. Knocked him back several feet. He laid. He's shaking on the floor. And at that time, I felt like God said, go over and tell him this. I said, well, tomorrow morning, Sunday, I want you to pray for every sick person in your church. I'm talking not to a Pentecostal Baptist. Pray for healing for every sick person in your church. He did it. Every sick person in the church got healed, including a woman's dying of cancer. And the community is a little bitty, just gets just getting started. New church. They called it. They nicknamed this church the Healing Church. I went to that church several years later. It was the largest church in that borough, that area. It was close to a thousand people. And it was this young guy. So after that, though, after he got this prayer, next Sunday he went out. All week long, he's been going out into Argentina. He's praying for people. He heard I was leaving. He comes to the airport. He called me on his cell phone. Hey, I'm coming to the airport. I want you to pray for me again. One more time before you fly out. I want you to pray for me again. I said, no, I'm not so sure that's a good idea. What if God comes on you in power like he did before? We'd make a scene right here in the airport. We'd get in trouble. I don't want to get in trouble. He said, I don't care what any man thinks about me. I just care what God God thinks about me and I am hungry for more of God and I'm going to drive three or four hours and I'll be there. So if you see me, you're going to lay your hands on me. Just promise me if I get there in time, you'll pray for me. I said, if you get here in time, I'll pray for you. He got there and sure enough, I was right. Prayed for him and he made a scene. He's and all that stuff. Not that you have to do this because John Arnott almost never manifests anything, but he moves in power and he moves in faith. So 
And I, and I prayed for other people that didn't have strong manifestations that God anointed them and gifted them. And when they went to pray, it, it, it started happening. And I prayed for an Arge, a guy from Honduras, a missionary from Honduras. And I laid hands on him. No prophecy. Didn't say a word. Didn't say anything different from him than it did to others. Just going down, fill, 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 fill. And most of them fell down. Three months later, I get the report when I went back. This guy who had been a missionary in Honduras for 30 years, Pentecostal, tongue speaking, baptized in the spirit, and the Pentecostal understand that word, had now received, seen more healings in three months than he had seen in the first 30 years of his ministry. I want to close with this recent story. A few months ago. Huh? Oh, thank you. I'm about to close. Which means we're getting about, we're circling the land. We're not on the land way yet, but we're circling. Because uh, I've got to have time. Um, I, we were in Mexico. And uh, um, Guadalajara or something like that. I can't even pronounce it. But anyway, uh, there was this Baptist guy came because we'd, we'd taught him words and knowledge, taught him praying for the sick and, and uh, had an impartation service. And he'd washed it on. He and his wife came up to me and the pastor said, this is a Baptist pastor. Now, he's never spoken bad against us. But he's never been interested in this stuff either. But tonight he wants to know, as the meeting was over, will you pray for him? And he's up on the platform. I said, of course, people praying down here. I said, yeah, I'll pray for him. So he and his wife came, a very nice couple. And I prayed for him. And um, nothing happened at first. And then after a few seconds, he just, they just kind of gently fell to the floor and were laying there in peace. No violent shaking or anything. So I left. I didn't know who they were. I left and we we're getting something to eat afterwards at the, in the building. And about an hour later, I'm leaving the building and I see that pastor and that was lying there so quietly. And he's got, he's over the shoulders of two of his elders or deacons and they're helping him out of the building. And as they're helping him out of the building, he's, he's shaking because it just got stronger the longer he laid there. And he's shaking. And the pastor, this guy, over, one, we, have an, we have several apostles in our network and they oversee hundreds of churches themselves. And uh, they see me as a leader to them. But I'm not over their churches. I'm, but they're, they're in our network. And so this guy named Bob, he brought me down there to, to speak to, to about 1,200 pastors. And, uh, and he told me this story. He said, I, you had to go home, but I stayed the next day. That Baptist pastor is on a concrete floor in a public building. I had a little metal chair. He squeaked. Like he shook all day to the point that squeak, 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 squeak. You know? And, and so, the, and he said, I went to his church with him the next day. Now, it turned out this guy had a church of 10,000 members. And the church building would seat 8,000. This was like 8.30 in the morning. He's still trembling. Two elders are helping him up to the pulpit. His intention is to say, I want to pray for impartation. And so, as he's getting up to the pulpit, he said, I... Uh, I don't know how I would say it, but you or, or, or impartation. Before you can say impartation, <laughs> power hits, knocks the elders out, knocks him down, and instantly, in the Baptist church, had never seen anything, 80% of the 8,000 people started speaking in tongues and crying and laughing and falling and shaking. And it didn't end. That 8.30 service did not end until 4.30 in the afternoon. Just the visitation from God. If I was a Baptist, that's the way I'd want to have it because that, you know, they're not going to fire you when the Holy Spirit's touched 80% of your people all at once. Now, in my experience, this is where I'm going to end with this. My experience as a Baptist pastor, um, when the vineyard came to my church, uh, the, uh, Blaine Cook, who was the leader at that time, he, this was before he fell. He, and he's a mighty man of God, really was. And I, 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 I pray for him to, the, to this day and. And I, I pray for his restoration. I, I'm for restoration. I'm for restoration. If he only turned, God would use him. I believe it with all my heart. But anyway, uh, he says this. I do not want you to come to the front just because you want to come to the front. Because all of you want to come to the front. I want you to wait because God is going to come upon some of you. And he's going to give you gifts of healing. And discerning of spirits. And words of knowledge. He's actually going to release gifts and the, and, and the baptism of the Spirit. And I do not want you to come unless, because I want people to see what God does. If you begin to cry, if you begin to shake, 
if you begin to feel the glory on you that you can't stand up straight, it's heavy. If you begin to feel hot all over, if any uh, of those things are happening uh, to you, tingling all over your head, if those things are happening, I want you to come to the front. But only if that's happening, and then we'll pray for the others. And, and a, a man in my church named John, who was mad at me, who had been really saved the night before, and this was the first night of the meetings with, with the vineyard guys. He's, there's no room to sit. So he's got his hand up against the wall. He heard the preacher say that. And this is what he said. That is a bunch of bull. I don't believe that. And say, he didn't believe it. He said, that's a bunch of bull. He no more than got bull out of his mouth. Then he thought his hand had gone to sleep. But by leaning on it. And so he starts moving it. He says, oh, my hand's gone. See how your hand begins feeling it's going to sleep. It's waking up. And then all of a sudden, the other one started. And then it just wasn't that. And then all of a sudden, it starts this way. And then all of a sudden, the glory hits him. And now he's bent over. And then the love and compassion hits him. Now he's not. I mean, he's not got a tear coming out. I'm telling you, he was weeping. He was. Oh, 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 and he's coming down the aisle. It's like, and I can't make my hands go as strong as his was. And he's coming down the aisle. And he's, he, he's, he's been, everything he mocked is on him. God's doing everything to him that he didn't even believe in. And he looked at me and he's crying. And he said, help me, Randy. Help me, Randy. Help me, Randy. I said, John, what's wrong? And he had con old hard contacts then. He said, I've been crying so hard. My left contact is killing me. And I can't get it out with my hands going like this. My eye, my left eye is killing me. And the session before this meeting, we've been talking about words of knowledge. And I just said, John, that could be a word of knowledge. And he said, you and those words of knowledge, I don't even believe in them. <laughs> and right behind him stood Tammy Ferguson. And she said, that's my eye. I just got back from the optometrist. I got to have it. I got to have surgery on it. John, in 30 seconds under the anointing, in 30 seconds under the power of the Holy Spirit, in 30 seconds, the man in my church that was the most carnal, newborn believer, the most proud, the richest, he had a new Corvette, a new Cadillac, a new home, two businesses, 39 years old, self-made man who strutted instead of walked. <laughs> that the whole church knew if there's one body, if there's one guy in this church that does not deserve this, it's John. <laughs> and God touched John sovereignly. And another woman named Barbara who was backslidden. And when she came into the meeting, and it's all over her, she fell to the floor long 10 years before Toronto. And she can't get up. She can't move. We carried her up. She's so drunk. She had to be driven home at midnight. And it was, it was this amazing thing. Well, I, for all my life, I've been reading about revival. I like revival. I, I said, oh, God, I've been born in the wrong century. I wish I could have been born in the 1800s with Finney, with those other guys. God, this is a dry time. I don't want to read about revival. I want to experience revival. I'd read about Finney. said, God, perceived that those waves of love and waves of electricity would have continued on my life. I would have died. I read about D.L. Moody who said, Lord, stay your hand. Let's just slay me. I can't stand anymore. And I'd been praying, God, that's what I want. I want to experience so much of you. I can't even stand it and I had in 1989 five years later I was crying on the floor God had knocked me down power's going through me so strong I said God you're scaring me I think you're going to kill me are you aware of how weak this body is because I felt like I was going to explode with a number of amount of electricity going through my body but I hadn't experienced it yet but I'd read about it and there was John a little bit later in the meeting after that girl by the way she got healed her eye went straight and the next night she was healed of spinal bifida she was healed of hydrocephalic she was healed of seizures she is on 11 kinds of medication for seizures under the care of seven doctors. And she is healed of hydrocephalic, spinal bifida. She had no control of her bladder. On the way home, she said, Mom, do I have to wear that diaper tonight? And Mom said, no, you don't. She never had to wear another diaper. I got in trouble because of the power of God. But I would get in trouble again any day to see a girl be healed of spinal bifida. To see a girl be healed of hydrocephalic and now her, her she's no longer hydrocephalic this was the power of God and it's worth it it's, you know people get upset about the manifestation well I, I want I, I tell you just on the end with this there was a manifestation I didn't like the crunchers the crunchers 
you know, back in the 1800s, they called it the jerks. But I would call, we called it the crunchers. There'd be people, I'd watch these pastors and, 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 and leaders, and they'd be up on the platform, and they'd be talking, and as you're talking, all of a sudden, you got, you got this thing, this constant, doing this. And I said, God, I don't want that. And one time, several, after several years, I, I went through, began to go through a dry place. And I thought, well, maybe I've quenched the Holy Spirit. I remember I praying, Lord Jesus, if you'll just touch me again, you can even crunch me. <laughs> if what I said offended you, if, if, and I was serious, I said I don't like that. Lord, if that, how, if that, if that, if that bothered you in any way, I'm sorry. You can even crunch me if you want. Even, <laughs> And so I'm just saying, you come to God without conditions. And, and so I was in that same meeting when that happened to John. I saw my thumb start twitching. That was all it was, just a twitch in the thumb. I'd never had anything other than crying. Now I got a twitch in the thumb. I opened my eyes and looked at it. This is just a few minutes before this happened to John. And I, I thought, God, I think that's you. I don't know if it's you or not, but I think it's you. And I got a Bible verse for it because it says that they anointed the right thumb of the, of the priest. And so it's the right thumb. So I got a scripture for it. So, Lord, in case that is you, I'm not, I think I could stop it if I wanted to, but I don't want to stop anything. You just do to me anything you want. And a little bit later, Blaine said, Randy, the Holy spirits on you raise your hand i lifted him up like that and the giant vacuum sweeper in the sky sucked him up hooked me up to the 220 wire and now i'm standing here in front of my whole congregation and i'm doing this and my life was changed i've never been the sense the same sense and i'll tell you something else on march i forgot what day it was this march something march the 23rd or something like that early in the morning i received a a a, 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 a message on my telephone and, and on my cell phone, it's a message. And it's from John. And John said, Randy, I am celebrating with you today. 26 years ago, on this day, the Holy Spirit came in our Baptist church. And neither you nor I have ever been the same. And I'm celebrating 26 years later. I'll tell you why. He's still the most on fire layman in that state that I'm aware of. So we want to give the same invitation that John and I heard and I have given this invitation the same way for 26 years. I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to pray a short prayer and then I just want you to wait. And I believe with all my heart that God is going to do it again because he looks for people. Who will take the kingdom by force. Just hold your hands out like this. And close your eyes. And take like t half a minute. To tell the Lord what you want him to do to you. And then I want to pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you love to give good things to your children. And you love to pour out the Holy Spirit upon those who ask. And I thank you for the stories that we have of what you've done. But we want to tell in a year from now the stories of what you did here. Holy Spirit, we invite you, we honor you, and we ask for you to come as the gift giver and the grace giver. And for you to baptize us afresh. Fill us again and put your fire on our lives. Put your supernatural faith in our hearts for miracles. Come with strength. Come with manifestation of your power. Because, Lord, I just believe that all the manifestations are is some people's bodies responding to the power that's in them or the love that's in them. So we invite you to come. And we ask that the angels would come like Mahesh Shabda's wife saw in one of our meetings where hundreds of angels came in to 
to bless and strengthen the people. But then there were three that came not to strengthen and bless, but they came with a scroll and they opened the scroll and they declared new destiny, the destiny over people's lives, that there was an elevation, there was a field commission, there was lifting someone up in the sense of, of responsibility and service to others. And Lord, I pray especially, Father, for pastors that are here, good pastors, God, that there would be an anointing come upon uh, pastors that would take them into an apostolic sight a view not just their church growing but the region being taken father i pray for elders any elders that there there would be a special grace of healing because it there's a, that goes with the office and i pray god that that would come every pastor every pastora lord in the name of jesus i pray that you would anoint them god i pray for every missionary that's here god that there would you would give us a, a greater grace to go into the darkest of places lord i pray that you would call people in to become a missionary who isn't one right now lord i pray in jesus name for fire from heaven and the power of your spirit the love a baptism of love and a baptism of power raise up another heidi baker raise up another mark raise up another late hetland raise up Father, let there be a repetition of what we've we ta just talked about. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we bless them. More, more, Lord. Multiply your power. Multiply grace. Multiply power. Make us more like Jesus. To speak on his behalf as his ambassador. And to move in his authority and power. In Jesus name. Those of you. That this power of the spirit. is touching you. Love. Peace. Anointing you. Touching you physically. Touching you emotionally. You're crying. Your heart's leaping. You're going into visions. You're hearing, the, you're hearing God speak to you. You're trembling. You have electricity over your body or in your hands would you come to the front and I am praying for also if you're a pastor and if you're a missionary we want you to come as well regardless of phenomena Father in the name of Jesus I ask as they come that you would multiply and increase the very experience that they're feeling now I'm praying God that there would be an activation of words of knowledge and prophecy the gift of prophecy the gift of prophecy to be released seeing and hearing that some God would begin to see and we actually could see uh, angelic and demonic spirits God Lord that there would be a, a sense of increasing discernment a greater discernment gift a quick gift the gift that's um, anaconda the gift that's on Pablo Botari to just step into the situation and almost know immediately what questions to ask to get to the root Father we pray in Jesus name fire from heaven fire from heaven the baptism of love in Jesus name multiply it multiply it multiply it multiply it multiply it take them deeper 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 lord in the name of jesus in the name of jesus in the name of jesus tom and i both need two guys to work with us in the name of jesus in the name of jesus more father